Before we begin, can we get two note takers, please? Oh. Can we get two note takers, please? I always forget. I'm on the full client. Should I not be? No, yeah. Yeah, I can hear myself. Okay, I'm sharing, but how do I flip? Do the chairs like to say something? Because I haven't heard any audio from you that works. What was that, Michael? Wondered if you would like to say something so I would know whether I can hear you. So can you Here's hear me? Here's one of the okay? remote chairs. Yeah, that seems to work. But hey, can you hear me? Ned, we, we did hear you, Ned. Thank you. Okay, great. Who should be timekeeper? Okay, we need two new two note takers, please, before we can begin. It's on the ether pad. Okay, we really can't get started until we have two note keepers. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Maybe I can ask one of the co-chairs. Hey, Nancy, this is Peter Castleman. I'll, uh, I'll do some uh, note taking for you as well. Awesome, thank you, Peter. All right, so with that, we can go ahead and get started. So with me remote, I have my two co-chairs, Kathleen and Ned, and sitting next to me to help me, because <laughs> I will mess something up, I know for sure, is our area director, Roman. Welcome to uh, our first day, first session of IETF 116. This is the remote attestation and procedures uh, working group. Uh, so we will be focused on that. If you're expecting a different discussion, you're probably in the wrong room. Why is it not flipping? It's just a while. Yeah, it just takes a while. Okay, so hopefully everybody is familiar with the note well, so I won't be um, 
belaboring that point, we've got to follow the IETF procedures and best practices. A quick reminder on the code of conduct, um, just be respectful um, and courteous to those that are both presenting and providing discussions. Keep the discussions professional, not personal, and uh, prepare to contribute. Okay, so I think we've got Peter and Richard. Thank you for being the note takers. Um, I don't know, Kathleen and Ned, I, I think, Kathleen, I've asked you to help with the time if you can. And Ned, if you can help uh, run the queue, would be great. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Okay, so quick agenda bash. We've got a relatively full schedule today, and I'm being blinded here. Um, we're basically going to cover a lot of the um, drafts, most of the drafts, as well as a few discussions vis-a-vis -vis, um, CORIM and EAT, as well as um, the attestation results. So unless there are any other comments on the agenda bash, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Dave? Dave Taylor, it's fine if you want to leave it this way. Um, the one that is at 1020 right now should probably properly just be labeled endorsements. Uh, and technology-wise, it would make the most sense before DAA. But if you want to keep like working group drafts before individual submissions, I understand why the order is the way it is. So up to you. OK, so you're OK with the agenda. Your slot is more on attestation results or um, I didn't quite get that. If you want to group related technologies, if you choose to do that, yep. then I would move the one that is currently labeled Corum versus EAT, which is better labeled just endorsements. I would move it up somewhere adjacent to the EAT and Corum discussion just to keep context of technology. But it looks like right now it's in the order of working group drafts first, individual drafts later, and that would be fine if you choose to do that as chair. So then you'll have more context switching in people's heads. Okay, since I'm not awake, <laughs> I'm just going to keep it in this order unless you really think. So I think we can move the, um, let's see, you wanted the, uh, the attestations, which is you at 1020, to be coincident with which one? I'm saying technology-wise, it makes the most sense for the endorsements discussion to be somewhere adjacent to whether before or after or whatever the eat and co-rim discussion, right? So in other words, 9.35 to 10 is eat and co-rim, and then you have various other topics, and then you come back to the one that you have on the slide is co-rim versus eat, which is probably the wrong name. And so you could move that one up two slots or whatever, unless you're intentionally trying to keep all the working group slots together. So. Yeah, and this is Hank um, adding to the uh, sequence. Maybe if we highlight what quorum is and then go to your discussion and then go to DAA, is that the best order in your point of view, maybe? Yeah. So okay. that would make it. If you put me before Hank, is that what you're saying? No. I'm oh, saying. I'm talking about the agenda, but. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, why, why, don't, why don't we keep it this way? Because yeah. Ned um, prioritized it based on the adopted drafts. That's a fair answer. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just keep it as is. <laughs> and uh, barring any other uh, any comments, we can go ahead and get started. Okay. So first up, we have either Thomas or Lawrence. Um, I'm here, Thomas, can you hear me? Yes, give me a second, I'm trying to, to switch. Actually, if you wanna share your own slides, you can. Oh, that might be tragic because I don't have them here at the end. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to find the... Uh... 
the switch. Creating materials. It's this one, right? I forgot it's a double click. See, I'm not awake. I can see it. All right, Thomas. Okay, I will start. Okay, media type, uh, eat media type. Uh, next, please. So, yeah. So this document provides media types registrations for all the top level types produced by the Eat Grammar um, and also for uh, co-op content formats, of course, um, is, so that everything that has a chance to be serialized to the wire is, is, is properly typed. Um, basically, the six wire format boxes in the picture, those with the strange uh, sort of cleaver shape, all get their base type. Um, next, please. Yeah, so here's the table that basically summarizes the whole document. Um, um, it says base types because um, uh, each of them can be specialized with a neat profile media type parameter if needed, uh, so that um, it profiles, uh, specific it profiles, do not need to mint their media types. Um, basically, they got theirs from uh, special, specializing the base for free. Um, now, the major thing to note in the slides is, is the one chart change uh, in the two top types, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Next, please. Okay, so what's new in 02? So we did a refresh for, for you know, including the RATS architecture, which has been published in the meantime. And the other thing we dealt with uh, uh, was uh, issue 14. Um, and uh, there, basically, we noticed that uh, the, the structure syntax suffix registry had a, a plus JWT already, which was defined in another RFC, 8417, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and to, to be used to indicate that the media type is encoded as a jot, uh, right? And so and then we took it from there. Basically, we now have a request to IANA for registering the plus COT uh, SSS. And and uh, and we have changed uh, the eat types accordingly, uh, as you have seen in the slide above. So it's likely like it's likely that we, we didn't push for for uh, the earlier location because otherwise we would have um, to to redo it basically at this point. So there's a life lesson here probably, which uh, being also be, being lazy is awesome. But um, yeah, next please. Okay, open issues. What we have two open issues. Um, one is uh, use cases and rational. So Nancy, you you asked that adoption that we uh, extended the use cases and rational to um, and to address uh, Anders' comments that were um, discussed on the list at the time. Uh, we did uh, the CFA, um, and um, having reread the. And the, the 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 document recently, um, I, I, we think that that the what the content of section one has as everything um, does, but but it would be awesome if if, if someone could have a, another look, and and confirm that so that we can close this. Um, uh, the other the other issue is the early location. So yes, please, if if someone could take the action. And the other, the other issue is the early location, issue 14. Um, and the action there is pending on, on the rats' chairs and, and on Roman. Um, but here the criticality is, is, uh, is dubious. It depends on how quick um, this document and it will, will go through the, the publication process. Because uh, if they go quickly, then maybe that, that's not needed. If, if they are stuck, then possibly uh, this would be an, a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, I would keep it, you know, um, as is at the moment, don't, don't sweat too much on this and, and we we'll reassess uh, as we go. Uh, so next, please. So next steps. Um, so none, none of those two issues is a blocker for requesting working group plus call. Um, 
this document is a companion to it. Now, it is past working group plus call, so we'd like to move this forward too, um, so that the two can be paired in publication, um, which makes a lot of sense because this one is really nothing but uh, a big appendix to it. Um, and by the way, this should be a very quick, low effort last call because the document is basically this gigantic IANA section. Right? There's no, there should be no risk here, except you know, for, for the reviewers to get asleep, but, but otherwise it's, it's really trivial. Um, so chairs, our request would be uh, for you to, to go ahead and, and start working group last call as, as soon as possible. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay. So. So Thomas, I heard two actions here. You need early allocation on the IANA, mm -hmm. I think. Well, we, we need you to take a look at early allocation and, and assess whether you know this makes sense. Uh, it might not, right? If, if, if we can progress the thing in uh, say two, three months, then there's no, there's no reason. <laughs> but uh, if, if we get stuck, yes. Sorry, Roman. So, so I, this is Roman as the responsible AD. I, I think I'm a little bit with you, kind of Tomas here. It, it really kind of is a question for early allocation. If we're going working group last call and this document looks as simple as it kind of looks, we're going to be really close to having the IANA review for that anyway when we go to ITF last call. So mm -hmm. why don't we kind of set a marker for ourselves if we think this starts extending into, you know, two, you know, one month or kind of two months, we can start talking early allocation, but I, I don't see that happening. Hopefully. Absolutely. Makes total sense. Okay. Yes. So, so I think we can take the action as chairs then to do the working group last call and then we make the assessment. Yep. Thank you. The other action maybe um, uh, was to, I don't know, Nancy, but uh, if, if someone could have a look at section one and make sure that we have addressed the, you know, we have sufficient. Yeah, since I made the request, I can, I can take a look at that. But I mean, as part of the working group last call, I, all right. Okay. Yes. I would request that you know the reviewers also sure. take a closer look at that that section as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. I think the request was made because uh, people needed clarification as to why the draft was needed. So mm -hmm. it would be good as a justification. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. Cheers. Okay, up next we have um, Tom on Quorum. All right, yeah, yeah, still me. I'm not sure I got slides for that one. Oh, no, I see them. My bad. <laughs> yeah, okay, Wait, Quorum. Uh, Quorum, uh, next please. Okay, so this is a quick recap of where we are, starting with the main things. Um, so first, we added a new bill of materials tag called, unsurprisingly, Kubom, uh, which tells the verifier without any ambiguity what it should consider as the exact set of tags that are expected to be used for appraisal. Um, the other thing we did was adding a couple of new conditional endorsement triples, uh, one with simple semantics and another one with more complex set of rules for matching called series matching. Uh, but, the, but the main thing here is that they both build on, on uh, the concept of a stateful environment. That is a combo of an environment map, which describes the good old target environment, plus a measurement map that carries the state of the environment that evidence uh, is supposed to match in order to associate the endorsed values. Um, so a, a typical example of this would be a certification endorsement um, where the extra measurement map would contain the ref values for the certified TCB, for example. Uh, so this is one, one possible application of the, simple, um, of the simple conditional endorsement. Next, please. Again, okay, so yeah. All right, so we did some work with Karsten uh, to quote unquote, uh, earmark the Seaboard tags in the 500 range for Corem. Um, basically there's um, a note for now for the designated expert of the Seaboard tag registry to check that um, other allocations do not use this range if possible. So originally the idea, our idea was to grab the block 
So 100 cool points starting at 500 for for Corim up front, but uh, this is not best practice. Uh, we learn for small code points. So this sort of year marking solution looks like a very sensible compromise. And um, yeah, thanks Karsten for helping out with this. And then uh, we have another yeah, bunch of smaller minor changes, which I think we can skip over. Um, so next, please. Work in progress. So we have two PRs in flight that we could not merge in time, unfortunately. They are both seeing some robust discussion uh, on the issue tracker, but they should land soonish, we hope. Um, one has been contributed by Andy, um, Andrew Draper, uh, that describes how Quorum data is expected to be used in the verification flow. And Andy is an implementer, so this is very, very valuable feedback that we are uh, absorbing here. Um, and also we, we, we have some holes in the introductory section. So there, there's a bunch of high level description that um, the other PR provides. So the other PR that is in flight at the moment, um, they would have made very fine addition for the zero one drop, but alas, we, we didn't converge in time, but um, soon we, we will. Um, so next please. To do, yeah. Um, so we have still a bunch of purely editorial work to do, which has been identified and, and, and dispatched already to the authors. Um, and there's some design work on the life cycle topic, uh, which we need to um, continue doing. Cobham is, is, is this powerful primitive in that respect, but we want to provide even finer grain controls here. So to let the verifier um, be able to, to give higher quality feedback downstream, either to the relying parties or, or other verifiers. For example, we'd like to make sure that the verifier can tell um, a relying party the reason why, for example, a golden value is not golden anymore, right? Um, because there's a vulnerability, then, and then there's a CVE associated with that and whatnot. Or, or for example, that the verification key that is um, that was used before is now associated with a compromised device, right? Stuff like that. Um, and this needs more than Cobham, Cobham can do. Um, so we are thinking about adding new triples for that. Uh, stay tuned. Um, and on top of that, we need to also set up the registries to deal with all the extension points in the data model, uh, which is you know tedious, but also necessary work to be done. Um, so we have these three macro categories of, of activity to, to finalize. So next, please. Right. Yeah, yeah. According to the current milestones, we should be in working group last call already. Uh, but in practice, we aren't. And, and we need more time to get into the right shape here. Um, so we was trying to assess a bit the, the, the remaining editorial and design work. And I think we are going to have at least a couple of iterations between now and San Francisco. Um, and I guess we should be ready just after the July meeting. So... September 2023 looks like a plausible date for starting working group last call on the document. Um, and I'd, I'd like to reassure that this, the sleep in the dates is not because of lack of energy or whatever. It's just that we are trying to do a good job here and you know, incorporating feedback from, from Andy and, 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 and Verizon. And it, it takes time. And uh, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, next, please. And just to yeah, just a reminder for the, the RAS working group that the editors have a weekly meeting. So you can, can click on that link for the details <laughs> if you're interested or want to discuss something in particular. Um, feel free to join. And I think that's it for my Quorima status update. Great. Sounds good. Cool. All right. So next up, we have uh, Hank. <laughs> you don't squat. Oh, it's on. It's very simple. <clears throat> Hi, this is Hank. This is a update on DAA and uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, as I tend to, I have to recap quickly what DAA is because it is not always so known. When you do remote attestation, typically the uh, testing environment is creating evidence. There can be plenty of them in an attester, it can be uniquely identified. That's not always very useful. Sometimes you just have an application specific reason. Sometimes it's about the privacy. So DAA is a already, already existing solution, ah, like 15 years old, but we haven't taken that into account when we wrote the architecture, but that seemed a little bit much to add. DAA is composed of two protocols effectively. One of them is setting it up, it's called joint protocol, and one of them is supplying all the attesters that want to be anonymous via the signing protocol. Next slide. Please. So we had a long discussion that was a blocker, basically last issue is how to put that DAA issuer that is facilitating these two protocols into the architecture. And we uh, were misled by the idea, I think for a long time that the DAA issuer is a role um, until Thomas Fossati was just up highlighted, we are doing a protocol. It's a join and the signing protocol. It is not a rat's role, it's a protocol entity that takes on rat's roles. That made a lot of sense suddenly. So here you can see how the DAA issuer is located in the architecture when doing the join protocol. Our next slide, please. You can see where the DAA issuer is located when it's taking on the signing protocol activity becomes an endorser. At first we thought it would be an extension to the endorser role that didn't work out. And actually kind of working through that conceptual problem took us way longer than we thought, but that was as basically the last step. So this is now resolved, reflected in text. Everybody who has reviewed it on the two reviews actually came in up today. Uh, we are very positive. So next slide, please. This, I think we're done. And we would like to ask for a working group last call. I, I'm almost afraid to ask what's profit. <laughs> um, the profit is that finally people can rely on how to phrase their text when they're writing documents about how to use DAA in REDS interoperable solutions, because there was no way to phrase that. And really, we were talking past each other for so long now, and we're really happy that everybody agrees. That's so the, the good profit. is we have alignment. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I hate to say terminology is the profit, but I'm kind of is. <laughs> okay. So yeah. uh, we can issue a working group last call for this as well. Thank you. Yeah, that was quick. Are there any questions? I think that is wild agreement that this is okay. Thank you. I'm not going far away because I don't know what is next. Um, Tom is next ah. on the message wrappers. Hi. Thomas? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? You're, you're back on. Sorry, Nancy, what, what did you say? You, you're up next to talk about the message wrappers. I'm here. Okay, cool. Um, message wrappers. Next, please. Cool. Um, so what is this thing? Uh, it's an encapsulation format for what the RATS architecture calls conceptual messages. Um, which, which is evidence, the decision results, ref values, etc. Um, and this thing parasites the media types and uh, the associated co-op co -op content formats and uh, and seaboard tags in a way. Next, please. Examples, uh, uh, for example, dice. Um, TCG DICE is, is using it, um, but we, we, we will come back to this point in a subsequent slide, so I will skip uh, this example. Uh, but just to say that uh, you know, DICE uses it for tunneling um, 
uh, conceptual messages through X509 infrastructure. Um, another example is the India tested TLS uh, prototype that, that we're building. Um, uh, we found it ex especially useful uh, uh, in background check topologies where using the wrappers allows the um, the relying party to be agnostic of the specific attestation format and uh, just act as a pass through between the challenger, the verifier, and the attester, both in the uh, um, attestation format negotiation phase, so at, at the beginning of the, the establishment of TLS tunnel, as well as the um, during the actual challenge response exchange. Um, we have a third use for this, which is widely different from the other two um, in APIs. For example, in Verizon, we have these so-called evidence blobs um, that are built on the JSON serialization of uh, CMW. Um, and then I added this fourth thing, which is archival of uh, attestation results as file system objects so using um, RFC 9722 scheme. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure <laughs> anymore about this fourth use case. You know. uh, but the, the, the other three are, are, are really robust. Um, uh, so next, please. Okay, advantage. So the main advantage um, of converging on a common encapsulation format is that it's easy to move the payloads across protocol boundaries, uh, which is what we want, right? So what we want, we want attestation primitives to pop up in protocols where they can provide added value uh, and therefore an ability to move across layers, these messages, these attestation messages with minimal friction is, is a goal. Right, and uh, this sort of wrapper uh, addresses the this desiderata. Uh, next, please. Okay, no, but like this is a, this is just a for uh, it's just a picture I made uh, to remind myself how one gets to this realized uh, CMW, which is the par parallelograms in the picture, starting from one of the typing constructs. Um, I think we might want to capture this in a section to help understanding what are the registration preconditions for using a specific CMW format. Um, but yeah, you will appreciate the symmetry. Well, except it's broken from... Uh, anyway, next, please. Okay, since London, what we did... Uh, next, please. Um, on the editorial front... Um, um, we addressed comments uh, and, 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 and fixes from provided by Carl and Karsten in their reviews, um, um, including, um, you know, adding, adding better examples using Cibor Pretty format, um, which is annotated X, um, and then reusing all the nice work that Ari, Karsten, and the core working group have done um, for the SNML extension. Um, there, including their a BNF for the content type, which we have shamelessly stolen, and which also happens to fix a bug in the a BNF that we ship with 01, so great. And also we reuse uh, 9193 terminology, for example, content type and media type name from there are just aligned. Uh, we are also using a the non-literal tag numbers which is a CDDL2 feature that allows us to express the ranges of seaboard tags numbers allocated in 9277 in a compact way. Thanks, Karsten, for providing the uh, syntax sugar for that. Next, please. Right, yes, this is the work in progress. Uh, so we have... Uh, we have um, uh, some review comments from Carl that are still pending, so we are working on them. Uh, and one of Carl's observation about the non-specificity <laughs> of the format is uh, generating some internal discussion about adding an, uh, a num or a bit mask that would serve as an explicit signal for the kind of encapsulated CML um, message um, alongside the more specific media type info. And that's the CDDL that we are um, currently uh, converging onto. Um, this would also support cases where the media type is coarse. Uh, say, for example, um, application eat plus cot. Uh, it is, uh, is, it, is this a decision result or evidence? You don't know, right? When, when you don't profile the, the, the base media type. Um, and also cases where the same profile identifier is shared by multiple different um, 
conceptual messages, which is an, an use case that Ned uh, brought up. Um, next, please. Okay, so this is interesting. So we have a bunch of cross working group, cross SDO discussion and work ongoing. Um, we have work done in, in TCG, in the DICE working group to add um, this X509 extension for uh, CMWs that I talked about initially. Um, this is targeting a um, new release of the DICE arch attestation architecture, 1.1. And um, I have been told by Ned uh, uh, that publication is not very far away. Um, and with, with publication uh, comes the uh, allocation of the uh, OID from the, from the TCG arc. Um, and in that document, the, 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 the CMW uh, draft is, is referenced and, and not just reference, also, you know, big portion of it are uh, copied, copied in, um, especially the normative CDDL and IBNF. Um, in parallel with that, we have discussion with Carl and Russ in, in LAMPs uh, to use CMWs in, in CSRs. Um, the decision um, that we discussed on, on list uh, was to use uh, the CMW extension in their um, key attestation extension drafting lamps um, by means of a reference to the TCG doc uh, once that gets published. Uh, so we have this kind of you know entanglement, um, interesting entanglement uh, ongoing. Next, please. So yeah, so we, we have this simple format that is useful and used in a number of uh, different scenarios, um, which is taken as a dependency, either directly on or, or transitively by others. Uh, so uh, we'd like to ask for adoption and, you know, and possibly put it on a fast track. Um, and since the document is, is basically ready, we, we would be, um, we would be also ready for working group as called by, by July, I think. Um, I would ask, uh, Ned about this, but uh, but the, the thing is, is is pretty solid at the moment. And we don't we don't plan to change it. So question is adopt. Yeah, I think we're <clears throat> the, the the timeline is dependent on the timeline in the TCG. Uh, but assuming that that goes through as expected, then that July wouldn't be a problem. Cool. Hi, this is Russ Housley. Sorry, I can't find the button right now. Yeah, I was going to um, say, you put yourself on the queue, but go ahead, yeah. Russ. So I don't think that's a reasonable schedule. There's a huge discussion on this topic in LAMPS right now. And if the, that doesn't come to closure, uh, you know, that they have to jive, right? Um, and so right now... It's the last agenda item on a very, very busy thing. So I don't think we'll probably even get to it this week. So I'm hearing that should be resolved. Um, I guess the question I have um, for you, Thomas, and maybe for Russ, is the reference in LAMPS referencing the draft that you want adopted here in RATS, or are you taking a subsection? And Oh, so RATS is referencing the LAMPS draft. Right. Okay, so we really need to have the resolution there before we can decide. Okay, so Thomas, I think you, you have that guidance, right? Uh, um, Nessie, is, so we don't, we don't reference um, uh, LAMPS key attestation X in, in, in CMW. We don't, we are, we are the terminal for, for the reference uh, chain. Basically, okay, I, the idea is that LAMPS references TCG, TCG references uh, CMW. So we are, we are okay, at the I bottom. Turn it the other way. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Thomas, OK, that, that, if that's the case, then the logjam is easier to resolve. Mm. But I thought from your previous slide. Right. Yeah. Um, what that last bullet says is the other way, right? That's why I was asking for the clarification. So Thomas, on your last bullet, it makes it seem like there's a dependency on the lamps draft. No, 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 sorry. Sorry for the confusion. I, 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 I now rereading, I, I don't, 
I don't understand how, how I no 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 that's that's not the case um, really the CNW is, is the is the is the bottom uh, of the dependency chain. So Lamps is referencing the CMW draft through the TCG uh, document. Indirectly. Indirectly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a transitive thing. So basically, in order to enable Dice and possibly um, Lamps, we need to first solve CMW. That's that's the point of my request for adoption. Yeah, I. I... I have to admit, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> we can take this but, offline, don't, don't worry. Um, here's, well, so here's what we can do. I mean, we're going to need reviews anyway as part mm -hmm. of the adoption call. So we can um, request that the, the feedback that comes in during the adoption call, that there's clarification by the authors. Right. So that as we get responses and the feedback, um, there would be some clarity around that. Okay, that makes on, on the dependencies. Yep. Right. So, 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 sorry. Just to 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 rephrase what you say, we go for adoption, and in adoption call, we we will add the clarifications. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Was that it, Thomas? I think that was your last slide, right? Uh, yes, I think I think yeah. that's that's the last one. Thank you very much. Yep, it is. Okay. All right. So next up we have Mr. Thaler. Thank you. Tank's mask on the floor up here. Whoever had an orange mask? Hank. Okay, yours is endorsed. Right? Yeah, the, the one who has the hi mic. I'm not as tall as Hank. Uh, yes. So uh, back when we did the RATS architecture document, uh, the charter did not have in there the ability for us to standardize anything about endorsements, but we had to define uh, the, con the concept in the architecture document. Since then, we have rechartered, and so now we can actually go into details about endorsements. Uh, and often we've had questions like, what do we mean by an endorsement? I read the text there, and do we actually have agreement on what an endorsement is? And so that's where I wrote this draft that's called RATS Endorsements uh, to try to explain what uh, at least the architecture document authors thought were uh, endorsements, or at least what I thought, and the hopes that we could get consensus. Um, I gave a... Uh, uh, presentation that went through an earlier version of this at the Competition Competing Consortium's uh, Public uh, Technical Advisory Council meeting. Uh, if you are in there, I hope I've already taken your comments into account, um, but uh, that was after the draft, and so the slides are new within the draft. Okay, so this is the diagram from the architecture document, and the top left is the endorser, and you see that endorsements line there okay. it as being one of the inputs to the verifier. Next slide. Or, you know, go forward. I'm trying. There we go. Okay. This is uh, cut and pasting the text out of the definition section of the RATS architecture RFC. Right. And so these are all relevant to the parts of the discussion here. You have appraisal policy for evidence, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. You can uh, copy it in there, but this is it required knowledge, in, or at least required state refresh, right, to, to get into the, the main point, right? So the appraisal policy is a set of rules the verifier uses to evaluate a tester. And it talks about how to compare information about the current state against information about maybe desired or valid states. We have reference values, which is a set of values that's used in that appraisal. Okay. Um, some documents may have used the terms like known good values or golden measurements or nominal values, but the architecture document did not use any of those because you could also have things like known bad values in addition to known good values, right? And so, or maybe you have, you know, ranges or whatever. So we used a more generic term called reference values, which is just things that are used may not be comparison for equality. And so I'll give you an example later. So we have the more generic term reference values. And of course you have evidence, which is uh, information about the attester, to be appraised, and the endorsement, particularly a secure statement, that an endorser vouches for the integrity of an attester's various capabilities, such as claims collection and evidence signing. Okay, That's the information we had in the architecture document. 
And most of the information in there about endorsement is captured in that one line, okay? And we wanted to elaborate, and so that was what I was writing here. So next slide. Okay, so let me elaborate on current state versus maybe desired state, right? Where desired including, you know, what's undesired, right? Uh, current state is something of a specific value. So this device at this point in time had this, this particular property with this value, okay? Now, that value is a very specific value of a point in time on a particular device. That value could still be a set, like the set of all the files in a particular directory, right? It's not necessarily a singleton, but it means that at a particular point in time, that value was present or true on this particular device at the time that that evidence was created. So that's the current state, okay? So conceptually, it's a single value where the single value could itself be a set. Reference values, as used in, say, desired state, could have many values. So, for example, if you have an allow list that says a value one, value two, value three, and the appraisal says the value in the current state must be somewhere in that set. Okay, that's an example of an allow list. A block list would be it must not be in, say, maybe here's the revocation list of certificates, not one of the things in this list, right? And so, again, there's multiple values there, and you're doing a not in, not in uh, type of operation. Another example would be to say upper and lower bounds on a range, like maybe a time range or a version number range or something like that, that says value one and value two. And I'm looking to see, is it actually in between those? This is another example of an appraisal operation you could do, okay? And so the appraisal is to say, take some of those values and, and interpret them and run the, the actual comparison between the name equals value pairs and whatever it is that the reference values are encoding in, in either an allow list, block list, some combination, et cetera. So uh, encoding the current state and encoding the reference state have some semantic differences, right? One is a statement of, of truth, and the other one is a statement of somewhere in this range or not equal to in the set or whatever. Okay, so that's current state versus desired state. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so ignore the colored stuff here and just do it now we'll start with this, the black parts, that's the same diagram before. And so now we're gonna add the red into it that says, okay, if we label what is current state and what is reference state, okay? Endorsements and evidence, you can say, are current state, right? So the evidence is, well, the following things were true in this device, and the endorsements it might be the manufacturer saying, here's some things that were true about that particular chip uh, when it came out of the factory. You know, it was this model number, and it has these properties, and so on, it might be in the endorsements, right? So it's a statement about current state about a particular instance, okay? Um, Reference values are things that are not specific to any, in, any particular um, instance. And so here the reference states in the previous diagram fits in the reference values, right? Now, of course, those are two different roles up top, although in some cases the same organization, say a chip vendor, might be both an endorser and a reference value provider, but conceptually are two different roles with two different conceptual messages carrying two different types of semantic content. And then the blue is to say, what do we have in the working group for filling in those? And remember, we have a bow tie model where sometimes we have multiple things, right? Whether it's in the working group, in other standards bodies, in uh, proprietary formats that are vendor specific and so on. Um, and so certainly um, evidence, we've got eat in that category. For reference values, we've got quorum in that category. And then when I first wrote it, I was putting question marks in what do we have for endorsements, right? You saw in Thomas's presentation, right? You talked about how CoRM has uh, like CoBOM, if I remember the right term. Uh, you'd put that in where those question marks are up there. And there could be other things too. Remember the bow, the, 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 uh, bow tie model, right? It says, how do we actually categorize these things? Okay. And how many of them is the IETF specifying versus specified in, you know, TCG or FIDO or vendor specific? Like what does um, ARM do in PSA? What does Intel do for SGX, et cetera? So got a bunch of these formats. And so each format you'd put it on a particular line. Um, and so there are those, you could think of those blue ones as being bad and maybe dot, 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 right? Okay. Um, go forward one. Okay. So this is the uh, main contribution is uh, this slide. And again, ignore the blue labels at the, 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 at the top for the moment, because the main slide is the contribute. I think I originally had um, in the PowerPoint, there's build outs that those appear, uh, but in the PowerPoint conversion, they're just slapped on there. So, uh, uh, here's the main point. So your appraisal policy, and this is trying to put what the verifier does and how to think about what an endorsement is and so on. So most of the content is basically this one slide here. Um, the appraisal policy specifies the comparison rules. How do I compare current state against, uh, against reference state? 
um, for any particular piece of current state or reference state, there might be multiple components. And so on the left, if you think about, say, a DICE example, you might have the current state for the hardware, the current state for the firmware, the current state for the operating system, and so on. So you have this notion of layers here. So like layer one, layer two, up to layer n. Example in the RATS architecture document would be like hardware, firmware, OS is an example, right? Um, and so that's uh, what we think of as being evidence, which um, like in, the, in many cases, layer one is part of the hardware, it's immutable, and it chains up from there, certainly in a DICE case. Okay. Um, DICE is just an example here, but uh, if people familiar with DICE will be able to understand uh, that there's multiple layers here. And so if you're using EAT, you might encode those with submods or whatever it is just to say, here's the properties of the hardware, it's the properties of the firmware, it's the properties of the uh, operating system, and there could be any number of different layers here. Similarly, on the right, when you have reference states, you're going to compare those against something. It says, okay, well, the reference states for layer two have to be compared against the current state for layer two. Okay. And so sometimes there's claims that get used at multiple layers, right? Some generic claims. Uh, and so you say, well, I need to compare the value here against the current state at layer two because this is the correct set for the correct range at the allow list, the block list for that claim at layer two. Okay. So the appraisal one is the one that does the matching there between those two. So that's why you kind of have symmetry between the left side and the right side, and the appraisal policy does the matching there. So now we down look at the bottom here, right? This is where endorsements fit into the uh, left side being it's a current state category that says, typically uh, the, the vendor will say, when this came off of the factory floor, here are the properties of that particular chip. Okay, here's the, 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 there was some key, say a private key or whatever that was baked into that chip or provisioned into the chip. And I'm signing the fact that that private key has a, is in a device that has the following properties, right? Has the following security properties or model number or whatever it is, right? And so the endorsement is coming from a different entity, right? And if this was uh, signed, like in a dice sense, right? In a dice sense, your current your, your layer one might have a key that signs layer two, that signs layer three, and so on until you get to the top. You can have layer zero key, you know, the factory's key that signs, say, the chip's key. And so on the right side, you're saying, does it all chain up to the trust anchor store? So what is the trust anchor store on the right, okay, for the case of the key in layer zero? Well, your reference state over here for layer zero, that's where your trust anchor store would be that says, okay, it has to chain up to say, you know, the Intel key or the NXP key or whatever it is, okay. That's an example of a reference state comparison here. So it's just saying endorsements fit cleanly under the left side. You still need comparison rules that says an endorsement comes in. You're going to compare that against reference values. Okay. Everyone yeah, understand? Because this, this diagram here was not in the architecture document. And this is what we're trying to make clear, at least what I'm trying to make clear, on behalf of uh, all the discussions we had in the, in the architecture document meetings, um, as where endorsements fit into the overall picture and the expectation here in the terms of the terminology. Okay. Um, Again, that's the main contribution of the document and, and why I think it makes sense, in my opinion, as a working group document to augment the architecture in more detail specific to endorsements. Okay. Um, beyond that, then there's comments about uh, security considerations and applicability of different formats, especially since we expect there to be, and already are, plenty of, say, vendor-specific formats and so on. How do we think about endorsement formats? There's already endorsement formats out there, not in the IATF, from a number of different vendors and stuff, and so that's just normal. That was already true for evidence, too. Okay, so in the IETF, we mentioned we have EAT over on the top left. We have CORIM on the top right. Next slide, please. Okay, so since our charter says that we will develop secure solutions for um, evidence and uh, endorsements and so on, then I had to have a security consideration section. All documents have to have a security consideration section. So here's what's in the security considerations. In security, there's an argument that complexity is the enemy of security, right? Some of you have probably quoted that yourself, right? It says, um, okay, you can do things that are complex. It just means that um, you have a higher attack surface area and higher risk that, that you have to mitigate in other ways, right? So there's a principle here it tries to argue that says, uh, can you go back one slide for a second here? Independent of what format you're talking about, the comparison rules code in the middle is simplest if everything on the left uses the same format and everything on the right uses the same format, right? You can imagine more complexity that says, let's say layer zero, one, zero and one used one format and layer two used a different format. My evidence processor is gonna be more complex than if layers one through N all use the same format, okay? In terms of code size, you know, how many different implementations are there, chance of bugs, now I got two implementations to maintain. Okay, so go forward one. 
So it's just an argument that says if you had the entire left side be the same format, it is less complex and hence less risk of security vulnerabilities than if you had multiple across the left side. And you can make the same argument for the right side as well. Okay. So there's an argument that says all the left side is simplest if it uses the same format. There's an argument that says everything on the right side if it uses the same format. Okay. And so for example, if you're using eat for both evidence and endorsements, then that's less risk than using eat and something else. If you were using CoRIM for both evidence and endorsements, okay, you'd say, yep, that is less uh, security risk than using a mix of them. The observation right now is that we have uh, current working group drafts that do eat for one and CoRIM for the other one and not the same for both. Even though there's people that have argued you could use CoRIM for evidence too. You could use eat for both too. This is not trying to say you should use eat or you should use CoRIM. This is saying you should use the same one. And so if you're using CoRIM, for example, you're probably a person that says, could I be using CoRIM for evidence? If you're an eat person, and so the point is when doing code in an implementation and in a tester, or maybe from a vendor, can you use the same one? That's the security consideration. Okay. But this is a question for the working group, because if working group standardizes two things on the left side and says you must use one, you must use the other, then we're choosing to say we're going to recommend something that has higher complexity and hence higher risk of security flaws. Okay. That's was what I was trying, trying to call out here, which is a job for the working group to decide what we want to do about that. Like, if we want to say, let's use, allow people to use CoRIM for evidence, too, if you're using it for endorsements, right? That would be a fair outcome, right? And I've heard at least one person arguing that. Okay. Similarly, if you were doing um, only eat for attestation results, like error for SI, and using vendor stuff on the left side, you might as well use the same vendor specific format all the way down the left side, right? That's, the, that's that one. It's just, if you're trying to do a mismatch, it's kind of saying there's some security considerations there. Okay. Um, all right, I th think that's it. Other than that, I think I have a summary slide next, but I think that's everything. Go ahead. You have two more slides. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, so far I've only mentioned security. It also has a point about footprint. So if you talked about constrained nodes, so if you're trying to do endorsements uh, uh, that could be consumed on say a Cortex-M, when would you ever care about consuming endorsements on a Cortex-M, okay, um, on a constrained node? An example, and there's a couple cases, uh, like I'm sure Thomas could think of another one. Um, one case is appraisal policy for uh, attestation results, okay, which is not what I'm talking about here, but that's a valid case too. The example here is I have a relying party. Uh, can you go back to the diagram here? I'll just talk through this one. It's probably easier than trying to read text. It, the, 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 the rats architecture diagram. No, go back to the anything that has the rats architecture diagram on it. Um, I don't remember. You, yeah, that one's fine. You have a relying party that's down here that needs to have a verifier. Great, I've got some verifier that's there. How do I trust the verifier? Often question that, that people have asked in the rats architecture. Okay? And we said, well, you can just implicitly trust it or uh, and this is called out in the architecture document, is you can say, if the verifier, before trusting them as a verifier, if you have a tiny minimal verifier embedded into the relying party that's only capable of verifying that one device and nothing else, okay, then all I have to do is I can uh, attest from the verifier to the relying party's minimal one. Once I pass that one, I can use the verifier for everybody else, right? Because I don't care about heterogeneity. I just care about the one manufacturer, maybe it's my manufacturer, so I can bake that into the firmware. So in that case, I've got some things down here inside the relying party that's as if there's a huge verifier and all those lines up there might be coming into the relying party. Now, some of those lines might be messages. Some of them might be things that would be baked into the firmware, right? And so if you're baked into the firmware, you know, you just rev the firmware, right? Then who cares, right? But if you do want to get a message that comes in, then that's a case where an endorsement might come to, to, the, to a constrained node as a relying party. And that's what the text says. And so if you care about footprint, how many different parsers do you need in a constrained node, okay? So now if you go back to the main diagram slide, you can say, well, do I need to be able to parse evidence? Do I need to be able to parse endorsements? Do I need to be able to parse reference values? Um, or are some of those just baked into the firmware? If I ever needed a parser for them, then the fewer parsers, uh, the better it is for footprint. That's the only consideration there. If you bake them into the firmware, no big deal. If you want to parse messages, then you care about how many different messages, how many different formats are there. And so that was the other consideration. Dave, when do you want to take questions? Yeah, now is fine, I'm done. So there's, I, okay. I, you did have one last so, slide. I, I think the last one was just summarizing the points. Yeah, there's nothing new on there. Go ahead, Ned. Okay. Well, we have some people in the queue. So Thomas is Thomas in the queue. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're gonna, we're gonna give you four more minutes. Okay. Because you're over. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, well, Ned. Or Thomas. Th Th Thomas. 
Hi, Dave. Um, so on on the previous slide, uh, the one of unconstrained um, nose, I, I, we we had we had you know thought about this um, a lot, and and I think what what really helps is in the, in this case is converging on a common uh, attestation result format, right? Uh, possibly it based, and let the RP consume this simple uniform format, right? So that you have in your case the little brother verifier that is collocated with the the, the RP. Um, that needs to a trust the big brother verifier, possibly via the attester collocated in the verifier, uh, verifying the evidence from there from the TE that runs the the verifier, and then be able to consume the attestation results. For example, in in the R4C um, um, uh, using the R4C semantics, and and if if you have read the the, the ear draft, that's exactly the thing, and this is how we think we. The, 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 the complexity problem could be solved in the sense that the the, line, the, the, the smaller line party can just implement a neat parser and 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 be able to consume the 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 R four serialization, right? Uh, done via it, um, and and apply the, the simple policy there. Uh, that's how we 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 think this mismatch could be uh, absorbed. Whereas. You know, in the general case where you have the complex verifier, the bow tie verifier of the architecture, um, uh, then you know, Corin makes a lot of sense. In, it's complex, more complex, of course, but uh, um, it allows you to treat very many different things uh, using the same base semantics. Right? For example, the idea of having a um, an environment that is uh, a precise data type. You know that can be used in subjects in triples and object in triples, and therefore you can create a, a semantic web out of these things and you know create complex views of what the device is. You know even complex devices, it's it's a great asset of Corim. Um, so if if we wanted to have say an eat format for endorsement, then we would need to um, uh, we would need to explain how, for example, matching works, right? Uh, what are the matching rules? How do, you, how do the target environment matching works? How do you do conditional endorsements and, and whatnot, right? So, and would that be, gen would we be able to generalize that? Uh, or it, would it be per evidence type, per it profile, you know, these kind of things. Whereas converging on this meta format, which is Corim, um, allows you to do, some more sophistication, but you're you're absolutely right that for downstream things, you know, um, small verifiers that are collocated with ERP, and it makes total sense to have a different thing than Corim. Um, and we think, uh, in our view, is that um, e an ER uh, serialization for for our force is is the way to deal with that. Okay, but thank you for raising this. Is great, Andrew. Yeah, go go ahead, Andrew, and you guys need to keep it brief. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a quick question. Uh, what is the uh, minimum uh, internal verifier? Uh, do you have a definition for that one? Uh, see the architecture document. I'm just trying to save time. Yes, yeah. we yeah. can take and, it offline, Andy's, or you Andy's can look at the queue. Okay. Yeah, Andy's on okay, the queue next. Yeah. So if you want to use the queue oh, tool to get Andrew. in. No. Thank you, Ned. Thanks, Ned. Andrew, you're on the queue. Andrew. Bueller. Are you on mute? Hank, come on up. Okay. okay. While he's coming up, thank you, Thomas, for the for the answer. Uh, we can take it offline. That's not the central point of the document, and uh, I think Hank is not the mic. Yeah, so um, we're waiting for Andrew. I think uh, Meet Echo is sometimes a, a blocker. So uh, this is Hank. Um, actually, and that is the basis for all decision in designing Corum is reduction of complexity of these big verifiers. So I hope that we are really adhering to the security considerations here. And I absolutely am in favor of this mentioning that like, uh, constraint, even maybe general, because they can just move away, just really be there very quickly. So messages have to be very concise and digestible. The relying parties must not have multiple stacks, uh, if avoidable. So, so I, I'm, I'm basically in both camps. For the big V, I, I see quorum. For the small V, I, I, I think Dave's absolutely correct. Okay, so I, I I changed the 
title, and I, that's why I got up to say that the title on the, on the agenda is not the right title here. That was the change between the time that I published the draft and the time that I did the presentation and the, in the uh, TC. So my goal is it, for draft 01 to remove any discussion that is uh, about you know, Corim versus EAT. It will just have the generic principles. It might mention Corim and EAT as examples or something like that. But the presentation here will match draft 01. And then my request would be to try to do working group adoption of the draft okay. 01 as soon as that change is made. Just ping the chairs yeah. and yeah. Because I want it to be, uh, the, the, the goal is the draft focuses on the, the, the text that was uh, being presented here as the main points, which takes into account all the discussion we had from you know, Ned and Hank and people in the other forum. So thank you. Okay. Thanks for Hi, that. Have I managed... the... Go ahead. Yeah, oh, okay. I've managed to oh. unmute myself. Excellent. Um, Andrew Draper, Intel. Um, so I think we're in an environment where we already have evidence coming in in multiple different formats. We, we've got EAT, we've got DICE, um, SPDM, many protocols are, are delivering the evidence. And so I think the verifier is, is kind of stuck in a situation where it has to transform that evidence into a format where it can be matched against reference values. And I think our goal should be to make that transformation as simple and mechanical as possible so that the verifier doesn't make any mistakes, rather than just saying it's, it's impossible to have any, any, um, any transformations. Um, and so, um, so I think it's kind of inevitable. We're in that situation already. Um, there will be evidence and endorsements in, in multiple different formats and, and it needs to be handled. Uh, the, the second one, I'd just like to echo something that Hank said, which is that the conditional endorsements that CoRIM provides is, is very useful. Being able to say, if you see a device with these measurements, then here's some more information about it allows you to build hierarchies. And, and that's the sort of thing that I think verifiers will want to do. OK, thanks for that feedback. So uh, Dave's going to update the draft, let us know, and um, we, we can do a call. Yep. So expect a new version, and uh, you can go from there. OK, next up, we have Geary. <laughs> Okay, hey, thank you. Um, please tell me when I get time. Okay. Thanks. So this is an introductory draft to a claim that would be uh, used in the context of each call and that I'm calling the approximate location claim. I'm going to give a brief introduction to the whole concept of a test approximate location. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. These are the main references that I'll be using. The first one is the EAT draft. Second one is the architecture draft. It's just been uh, advanced to RFC status. Third one, you can actually look it up in your own leisure. It is a, it is a white paper that uh, me and a couple of other authors put out last year on the concept of secure ranging using ultra wideband. So we go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> a tested geolocation is a, is part of a is part of a means by which an attester can provide evidence of its security state related to geolocation. And as we know from the architecture document, the attester is composed of an attesting testing environment and a target of attestation. Evidence can, can come in the form of claims, which can be sent in the sent via cryptogram to a verifier. Um, I'm not going to comment on the conceptual messages document that was uh, presented earlier earlier today, but that's the way I think of EAT as a cryptogram. Usually verification is self-contained within the relying party, but it's not strictly necessary. The architecture document actually allows for disembody, disembodiment of the verifier from the relying party. Why is that relevant? I'll get to the next slide here. <clears throat> so recall, this is a basic, uh, basic attesting uh, <clears throat> um, attestation architecture as, uh, as described in the architecture document. The uh, testing environment and target environment are all so are intended to be self-contained within an attesting entity. We go to the next slide. So, attested geolocation is a mature feature. It's been in the. It's not just been in the EAT draft for uh, since the beginning, since the since the Dash Zero Zero version of the spec. It's also been productized as well in several different forms. And offline, I can point you 
to some commercial uh, commercial implementations of this. And as we determined during the uh, during the development of the draft, there's an underlying assumption that the attester has access to trusted sensor data from which it can derive the location for uh, for uh, location data for the claim. And as of the as of today in the EAT draft, that's conveyed in the form of a known geodetic coordinate system, WGS84 being the being the target uh, target method for conveyance. Go to the next slide. So let me change gears and talk about something that is actually being developed in the industry right now in the security industry called secure ranging. Secure ranging involves a process where a reader is able to detect the relative location of a target device. And it uses this information as potentially a factor in the context of authentication, not necessarily a sole factor. Um, some of the examples I've depicted there are, uh, are car door unlock, um, uh, physical access to secure facilities, um, also point of sale, although that's, um, that's, uh, me, that's a uh, use case that's currently being developed right now. If we go to the next slide. Now, a reader may seek to attest to the location of the target device and this is where, in my opinion, the RATS architecture didn't quite address this use case. It's something that I've call, called in previous publications of my own delegated attestation. So this isn't really, uh, th this is the reader in this case providing attestation evidence, but providing attestation evidence of a device that's outside of its, in uh, of its implementation. So that's why the geolocation claim didn't really do justice for this. And that's why in this document, I define approximate geolocation claim. And it included, includes ideally the two pieces of information, a unique identifier of the target device in the EAT document, we call it UEID. And then the projected location of the target device, um, hopefully to a known geodetic coordinate system. And then the relying party who actually receives this uh, the uh, an attestation with approximate location can actually provide can actually use that as part of any uh, authorization uh, mechanism that they're implementing um, before they actually provide uh, provide um, access to the uh, to whatever assets are required by the device. Um, so that would be part of the standard appraisal policy. Here we go to the next slide. Oh, how does the reader know this? Well, there's an assumption that the reader knows its own geolocation and the reader can detect the relative location of the device. Usually that's uh, distance and angle of arrival. I'll assume the horizontal angle of arrival for now, vertical angle of arrival is also possible. Possible That's relative elevation. And um, I give an example here, sorry about the uh, uh, not capitalizing GPS. Use of map-based projection is one way to estimate the uh, to estimate the projected G GPS coordinates of the target device. Go to the next slide, please. So I give an example here that's not actually discussed in the document in any kind of detail, but one possibility is use the UTM system, which is used to common uh, which is used to project latitude and longitude to map based coordinate systems. Um, the there, there are other ways to do this, taking a, do these projections that are non-UTM to take into account curvature of the Earth. But I'm saying, that, but my contention is that uh, curvature of the Earth is insignificant, given that these distances between the target device and the reader are going to be relatively small. Um, technologies such as ultra wideband are not large range, so it's not it's not a big consideration. Um, Geolocation UTM conversion in this case is, is done via well-known formulas. I give the uh, UTM conversion for, um, for this conference center here as an example. Okay, we go on. So if we have a relative distance D and an angle of arrival phi, then it's pretty easy to project a UTM pair. Um, e, uh, Based on the UTM uh, or, uh, UTM plane, and then the uh, then you can actually do a UTM to WGS84 conversion if so desired, 
So now you get geolocation coordinates back out in, in, G, in latitude and longitude, um, and they're provided by the reader. Okay. And I'll just make a note here that um, so there is a possibility that this location uh, it could transition UTM zones um, where the reader is in one zone and the device is in another zone. That's going to be very rare. If you look at these UTM zones on a map, there are thousands of kilometers in dimension. And, they, uh, and um, it's simply, it, 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 it's possible to account for these, uh, these border convergence, but it's not, uh, it's not strictly necessary. Okay, let's move on. All right, so here is the, uh, here is the target architecture where the secure ranging reader will actually, um, will actually uh, determine the relative location of the target device. And then, but the secure ranging reader has the attesting environment and it is the one that makes the final projection of the, ge uh, uh, of the target device's relative location onto a known geodetic, convert uh, geodetic si uh, coordinate system and provides that to the lying party. The secure ranging reader also needs a way to identify the device. Usually these secure ranging protocols are accompanied, are, are accompanied by an out of band protocol as well. So I mentioned ultra wideband as being an example. There's usually a Bluetooth connection between the target device and the secure ranging reader to provide out of band information. So the ranging reader can define, it can derive a uh, unique identity for the target device that way. <clears throat> Let's go on. I'm done. I'm almost done. So I mentioned the, tar the, the identifier. There are several ways to do this. I won't dwell too much on this. Um, let's, let's move on. Let's. So, so Gary, you got a question in Jabber. Uh, Tomas Posadi is asking, what is the trust relationship between secure range reading, between the secure range reader and the target device? The, there, as I mentioned, there's an out-of-band channel that can be established to, to bring in a trust relationship. Um, I also, also the keying material that, uh, the, and that's really has, I'll have to give a tutorial on ultra-wideband if I want to do that. The keying material for the over-the-air admission in ultra-wideband is known only to the target device and the, uh, and the secure reader. And that's actually derived from a secure element that's instantiated in both sides of the uh, both sides of the connection. Yeah. So this is what the proposed claim looks like. The only thing that's not uh, that's not uh, mandatory is the UEI. Uh, that's not optional is the UEID. Why? Because there are certain situations where a reader can actually not be able to determine a relative location of the target device. Like there are certain unfortunately well known black box attacks on ultra wideband, in which case. The UEID, just conveying the UEID alone, my contention is it's still meaningful uh, and that a verifier can, a relying party can use that to, to make a security determination of the uh, instantaneous operating condition. Okay, we, we yeah. need to cut the hey, because you're at time. Hey. We can put it in the open, open mic too. What's that? We can put the questions in the open mic too. Open mic. Yeah. Okay. okay, Hank was in the queue, but it sounds like we don't have time for that. No, Gary? Yeah. I was cutting the queue saying you you oh, know you keep keep it quick. Yeah, okay. We'll okay. Um, and is then it? we're just eating up okay. into the open mic. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, I'm trying this is saying I'm trying to keep this quick. Um, what I hear is that you need a new claim. Mm -hmm. Um what what's the problem with the architecture again? I, I don't get it. I don't think it was Steve. The architecture doesn't. Uh, the architecture, in my opinion, doesn't con cover the concept of delegated attestation. So, I, so you're, I, you're not delegating anything. Yeah. Huh? How do you delegate? You, you I am. I am asking the reader to attest to the location on behalf of a device that's not part of. That's not incorporated within the reader itself. Okay. The entity is not. The entity yeah. is the reader, but the reader is not. Uh, but the reader is uh, providing an attestation of yeah. a third uh, of a different device. Okay. That's, that's, uh, even if if that is somehow actually an attest of the right box, I could say that there is no definition of the distance between an attesting environment and a target environment. Um, first of all, and then. Uh, all that could be a conceptual attester, and I still think only the middle box. Is and we, the can, we can we can yeah. take that offline. Uh, okay. Ned, did you have a question, or can we move on? Uh, I think we can move on. So, sounds like we want to take okay. this offline. 
Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Okay, next up we have Hank. Use or use. Oh, that. I have another one. Well, pick it up. I, That's yours. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, this is Hank. <clears throat> Talking about EPUB markers. Um, next slide, please. In the uh, REDS architecture, we have a extensive section about freshness and multiple ways how to establish a, an idea of freshness for messages in a, uh, I wanna say, REDS domain. So in a REDS domain, at least we have one attester, one relying party, and one verifier that is somehow supplied. So all these have to understand somehow that messages reflect reality. In short, that's freshness of a message. Um, one of these ways is to uh, distribute amongst all these players a kind of tick uh, that we are calling an epoch ID. And if you know and identify this tick, um, you can use it like a nonce. I'm not saying nonce actually, but you can use it to be incorporated in your messages to show that these are fresh because you have that tick content. Every tick rings in a new age of freshness, hence we're calling this an epoch ID. Next slide, please. So it's a very short summary of a big topic. <laughs> so um, epoch markers are now an implementation, so a specification for this, as CBO messages for epoch ID types, I'm saying here. So first of all, apparently CBO. Um, second of all, I'm saying nonce like because and there's a number only used once, but if you send that nonce to three parties and they can all use it nonce, it's not actually a nonce anymore. So naming is hard in this place, but I'm using the term nonce here to convey the uh, similar concept. We had discussion on this already. This is a, a work in progress terminology, I'd say. Um, in the architecture ID, we have this uh, handle distributor. And uh, as we are ringing in new ages of freshness, uh, we are doing this with a bell. Uh, like a clock tower, that's the epoch bell. And if it rings, a new age of freshness starts. That's a new rats role that we introduce here with uh, this epoch marker uh, ID. How you then distribute these epoch markers that are epoch ID instantiations um, can be done, for example, via interaction models defined in the uh, rats reference interaction models ID. There might be other ways, but it's pretty, uh, uh, complete. So next slide, please. We uh, worked on this for a few iterations, not because the concept is so complicated, but there is something out there that gives you already a signed timestamp. And uh, that is an R relatively old RC, 15 years old. Uh, I think the reference comes later, something with a three. It's the trusted timestamp authority ID. And then we found out there are many interesting ways to uh, uh, augment a tick. At a minimum, it's a CBA time tag that you sign with COSI. But there can be other ways. There can be structures that don't need COSI because they implicitly have values in it that proves their integrity and such. So all of that are types. There are seven of them at the moment, and they're listed in this uh, individual draft. Um, we also included a concept that you might want to trust that bell also. That's again rats nested in rats. We call that a bell veracity proof. There's a stop for that um, because we don't know if or uh, how the working group would like to do that. Our important part is the payload. The veracity proof is, I think, a nice to have, but we have to find out if there's enough demand to go forward with it or make an extension point if it's not interesting yet. So we are at a point where, next slide please. The author thinks this is uh, ready for adoption. So our request would be a 
WAC. Um, there are seven types of uh, um, payloads there. Carl Wallace already commented on all of them, I think, and had a small question to all of them. Um, that would be uh, the thing we would expect for a working group adoption call uh, when it really would be issued. Uh, we will already, of course, uh, take into account Carl's feedback, but uh, that's basically it. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. And I think a lot of people are asking all the time when this is done, so we should move this a little bit. Yeah. Okay, now I have a question. You. Thank you. So uh, normally you might expect the verifier or a relying party to provide a nonce or something uh, that's dealing with the synchronization issue. Why wouldn't those entities be, you know, the bell ringer? As every red so roll, they can be collapsed. You could collapse them on a relying party. You could collapse it into a verifier. It's another rats role. So you're saying, hey, even for a nonce, we ought to have a rats role that says the the synchronizer is a role that is collapsed with the verifier and it produces a nonce. No, because there is not a non no nonce here in this. I'm calling it a nonce because it's nonce like. And now I'm see I'm actually causing confusion. Dave was right. <laughs> yeah, my, my, no, my, my for nonces you don't need this. <laughs> no, right. But I'm, I'm 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 asking the question about generality of the architecture. If we produce, mm -hmm. if we define the role for the bell ringer, which is basically a role for synchronization, mm -hmm. then we could ask the question. Well, if I use a nonce for synchronization instead of a bell ringer, does the role definition still make sense? In other words, if I collapse the 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 nonce ringer role with the verifier, then I have what we have today. Is exactly. We, we could we could argue in text that if you do a certain subset of this payload without the message around, you basically have what you already have today. Okay, I think Dave. Yeah. Um. Dave Taylor. Um, so Hank asked me at the uh, hackathon whether this was a uh, role or whatever, and I pointed him to the existing RFC, uh, to the part where the hand Epic ID distributor, I think, is actually shown as a uh, role there. It's not one of the core roles because it's only for a specific freshness mechanism, which is why it's not in the top part, but it is in the document. So it's not a new role per se. It's one that's already in there. Uh, it's different from a nonce distributor because as the architecture document talks about, the uh, Epic ID can be distributed to many different, you know, verifiers, relying parties, attesters, all together, and that's why it's a separate role. Unlike a nonce, which you, which uh, one role generates internally as part of its own thing, it doesn't have to distribute it to multiple of them for use in multiple exchanges. So it's a little bit different from a nonce, and that's why, uh, as uh, Hank was alluding to, I didn't like the word nonce in this document. I think it's misleading, uh, but um, I would support this being. Uh, going through working group adoption with some terminology changes. This was Dave Taylor. Any other comments? I think you have gotten some feedback, so mm -hmm. um, we can do the adoption call. Thank you. Wow. I'm so fast. You are fast. <laughs> he complained because he wanted more time. Um, OK, so we have one more. Thomas, are you on? I'm on. OK, I'm trying to bring yours up. Thanks. I think we need to skip through most of the material, right? So maybe next, next, please. Uh, yeah, this one we can skip. Next, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We, we don't have time, otherwise it would go through this, but. Oh, we, you, you have time because Hank was uh, early. Oh, okay, oh, okay, sorry, yes. Okay, so I can, right, um, well, let's go, for, let's start from here. Uh, for, for, for those who, who have no idea what, what I'm talking about here uh, is a format for carrying attestation results. And specifically, it's an EATS realization of the R4C information model. Um, the claim set uh, is split into three logical blocks. 
Um, you have first a bunch of claims associated with the verification context, for example, freshness, you know, timestamp, verifier identification, and so on and so forth. And then there's one uh, or more submods containing the appraisal itself, uh, as in our force, it was worth in as vector, um, plus, you know, some appraisal specific metadata, for example, the identifier of the policy under which the appraisal was conducted and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then you have the, this third logical block uh, that is um, um, for extensions. Um, in fact, the format is extensible and, and both um, with both standard and vendor uh, specific extensions. Um, and it obviously has a profile being a neat, uh, which is the nice tag you arrive at the bottom of this uh, gray, uh, yellow, yellow, yellow figure. Okay, next, please. Um, right, so um, we we spent the last few months between now uh, between between ITF one one five and now uh, prototyping, busy prototyping, as we promised in uh, in London, um, and we had to deal with two non-trivial use cases: um, th that of the composite attester, where you have multiple um, attesters within the same device. Uh, each providing their own um, evidence. And another, uh, another uh, use case was that of a split appraisal um, that is typical in, in um, confidential compute scenarios where you have a platform um, um, evidence and a workload specific evidence and you normally split the verification where the platform verification is done by uh, you know, the vendor um, uh, verifier, whereas the workload uh, verification is done um, by, by the relying party, basically downstream. Um, and this prototyping lets us to uh, adjust our initial design. And the result is captured in the draft and reflected in the implementations that we have. Um, so next, please. This should be the implementation status. Yeah, exactly. So we have... Uh, um, in terms of running code, we have a Golang package and CLI, and we also have a C library. And both are the high fidelity implementation of what's in uh, draft 00. Um, they're verbatim implementations in front of that. Um, they both deal only with the uh, JOT serialization. Um, we have had some interest from Huawei to possibly contribute the COT, ver um, COT serialization, but for now, JOT is all we have um, in the in the public um, repo. And uh, the Golang implementation has all the bass and whistles. And, um, and while, while the C1 is relatively minimalist, um, it's basically a stripped down uh, RP that can verify the received jot and, and pull out the bare minimum from the year claim set. Uh, whereas the Go uh, implementation, implementation is, a, um, is fully fledged, both uh, the verifier role and the RP, uh, plus this nice CLI that you can used to play around with years, so to synthesize things, to do offline verification, to do pretty printing and whatnot. Um, so next, please. Uh, yeah, so, so, so the idea is that the intersection between ER and RATS is, is clearly um, uh, non-null. Um, in fact, uh, ER combines these two well-established uh, working group items into one concrete, readily usable, readily usable um, payload. <coughs> Um, so, you know, from that point of view, it looks like a perfect candidate for, for becoming a, a working group item. But um, at the same time, one could say, you know, it's just another ETH profile uh, with its own verif identifier and, you know, the well-documented claim set, so why bother, <laughs> right? Um, I think there are good arguments both ways. Um, and, and the charter seems to, to support both outcomes. Um, so, um, I don't know, the, the, the authors would be happy either way, so we think um, it's for the working group to decide, basically. Um, so the question is, uh, next slide is uh, uh, whether go for um, working group item A or uh, it profile B. That's it, I think. Or maybe there's another one. There's another okay. question. It, Dave just got on Thank the you. queue. Um, uh, can you so, add me to the queue too? Uh, no. My app just crashed, so I'd okay. add me to the queue. So on the queue is uh, Dave and then Gary, Gary next. Uh, Dave Thaler. Um, <laughs> I think I would argue for B and combine it into the existing AR4SI document and not have two. 
Uh, in other words, AR4SI can just define the EAP profile for uh, AR4SI in the AR4SI document, and then you don't need a working group adoption call. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you. I think there was, uh, we discussed this uh, and um, Eric had pushed back. Um, we might want to ask Eric if he's still of that opinion. I was neutral now. He, he's not on the... Uh... Ah, okay. He's not remote. Um, yeah. Right. We can discuss this on, on the list then. Yeah. But thanks for the feedback. Go ahead. <clears throat> Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, it's more of a general question since we're talking about working group adoption. And this also is a question for the contribution that I discussed earlier. <laughs> and even covers PSA token. How are we, it, it, do we have guidance on, we on whether a claim or a profile related to EAT needs to be adopted by the working group because this will eventually lead into possibly some sort of registration with Diana. I mean, does it need to be vetted by the working group? Does it need, even if it's an informational draft? Because I noticed PSA token, for instance, has been, you know, it, it, you know, has been around in the group for, for several years now. It's gone through several iterations, but it was, doesn't seem to be ever, ever gone to the step of being a, a formally adopted by the working group. So what is, well, the, I mean, what is the guidance on this? So to my knowledge, any document that gets published through the IETF has to be either adopted by a working group or you need to find somebody to shepherd it as an independent. So given that there's relevance here in the, in the RAPS working group, I think it behooves us to, to adopt it here in the working group. Okay. Hey, Zanikia. Um, uh, Dave Thaler, um, not in your slides, but the document also does have a section about uh, TEEP. And I think that should not be, that part should not be in a RATS document. Uh, feel free to bring that to the TEEP working group, where it would be perfectly appropriate to discuss. But I, uh, I, and I'm thinking about the scalability, right? Because TEEP is just one profile. There could be other profiles over time. It doesn't make sense for me, to me, to have stuff for every other working group in the RATS working group, right? It makes, it makes sense to me to decentralize that and put them in the working group that was actually defining, you know, what the relying party needs and what the claims are. And so there's a EAT profile for TEEP in the TEEP working group, as you know, and I'm saying that's where the discussion belongs rather than in a RATS document. And so I would put everything except for the TEEP part in the AR4SI document was my previous comment, but this one was what to do with the TEEP section. Thanks. Absolutely. I wanted to put that as, you know, a documentation uh, point, no, nothing more. Lawrence, Lawrence? thank you. Yeah, just a bit of background on EAT profiles. In the, the registration of those is through OIDs or UR, URNs, and the intention there is, is very broad and very open and not necessarily inside I, even, uh, even IETF and but if you want to standardize it, a profile, you know, standardize it. If you don't, don't. Rich Schultz in the queue. Yeah, Rich Schultz Akamai and TLS registry expert, uh, designated expert. Um, you can actually just write a draft. It doesn't have to go through a working group. You can write an individual draft since they're not expired anymore. That meets the documented requirements. So it does not, you can write a, your profile can just be, here's my, here's my thing. Any other comments or feedback? So I think we need to take up the discussion on the mail list, um, Thomas, given that you need your co-authors to help chime in. Okay, yes, especially on, on Dave's comment, yeah. Correct, yeah. Cool, thanks very much. Of course, thank you. All right, we actually have a record. I think this is our first session where we're actually ending early. Um, we, we have open mic. So any other business comments? We have open mic. Lawrence is coming up. Yeah, I wanted to ask the question about endorsements and what I didn't see mentioned in Dave's document, which was um, 
uh, where it, doesn't endorsement have to have, to, isn't it typically going to have a public key that's going to be used to verify the signature on the claims? It seems like that is the most fundamental thing about an endorsement. And I didn't see it mentioned in, in there. And that, and that, I think that definition aligns with the RATS architecture definition of endorsement. Dave Taylor, happy to add that. I think the, you'd make the same thing about uh, evidence, right? And so uh, the, the definition slide that I mentioned, uh, when I presented the definition slide into the CCC tech, somebody observed that, why does the word secure appear on the, uh, on the definition of endorsements, but it doesn't occur on the definition of evidence? And I said, yeah, they should all be secured, all signed by a key, right? So it applies to all the different conceptual messages. They have to have some key that signs them, and that's true for endorsements, just like everything else. So yeah. And so if that's not clear in the document and you think it should be, happy to add that. So. Michael the, Richard, the, the, the endorser has a key, and they sign the, 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 the uh, claims in the endorsement, if you use the word claims, right? You sign the data in, the, in there with the endorser's key. Michael Richardson's on the queue. Hi, what? I'm not sure. Michael so, Richardson is on the queue? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Is Go ahead, Michael. Add, is other business for the working group, not for this item? Is that right? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, so I guess I, I um, was hoping for time at COAST, but um, it didn't, didn't get any about the question of um, the, the E media types. I know we discussed this, this earlier today, um, but basically um, what I wanted to make clear is that there's, a, there's other uses, other people using that stuff, and I, I really would like to have the conversation at the Coast Working Group about that, um, but we don't have time. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up that I, I think that, I don't know, I don't know exactly conceptually what, what we should do here, because I think there are, are we had previous uh, previous usage or suggestion that we should be writing plus plus CBOR plus COSY. And now you guys want to do plus CWT, which is not wrong. But anyway, I, I'm just not sure how to resolve that in the end. And I don't think this working group is the right place to do it. So I, I think I said that in email before. Thomas, Fasadi, you're on the queue. Yeah, I, 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 I was in the queue for another thing, but uh, since Michael brought this up, um, yeah, we, we can continue the conversation on the COSI mailing list, right? Uh, I have sent some, we, we had some, some back and forth there. Um, we didn't hear from them, basically. So we might want to prod the, the discussion again um, on this. And uh, the, the other point I was I wanted to make was um, on endorsed values and endorsements. Um, maybe Dave, if you could uh, make the distinction between identity endorsements, so for example, verification keys and endorsed values, for example, certification status, you know, color of the device, whatever, that would be great. Um, and I might want to link you something that I did for Corim in that. Thank you. Hank, you're on the queue. Yeah, exactly. This is Hank. Yeah, I want to mimic basically what Thomas said. Um, a public key in a signed document could be a kind of endorsement, but it's basically in an identity document now. So, um, um, because that's the smallest identity document imaginable is a signed public key, for example. So, um, I wouldn't confuse that with an endorsement. I think endorsement needs more or it needs some real good resolver that tells you that this top key is used for endorsements. Um, and I, I think I think there's more to endorsements than that. And I, I would not uh, recommend create endorsement that look like that because we'll never know what it is. And this is basically a uh, protocol cross tech abuse 101. Um, and therefore, I would say uh, endorsements include more information than that. Lawrence, you're in the queue. Yes, uh, continuing on endorsements. Um, I think it's a lot more than just a key securing a message. The endorsement carries with it um, a lot. It sh should carry with it implications or 
somehow indication or uh, information about what level of trust, I mean, basically what you would expect, you know, level of trust of, of the, from the evidence. For example, it could, it could say an endorsement uh, could mean you can trust every claim coming out of this uh, device uh, implicitly, and you don't have to check them for against anything. You could you could say that um, an endorsement could say I'm only signing this thing with a key up in the the Linux application layer, so it's not very good. Endorsement could say I'm tr this stuff that's coming out of here is made by an American manufacturer, not a you know a I don't know some from uh, some other country. The, the, there's a whole bunch of implications behind the endorsement, and that seems very important and fundamental to a definition of endorsement rather than just some range values to check against. Andy's on the queue. So I think that the, the sort of endorsements that I'm thinking of are, are things like, I know that this device is running the 1.0 firmware. And that's a useful thing for the device manufacturer to, um, to, to say. It's probably not the whole thing that the relying party cares about. The relying party has a policy about which firmware the device should be ru um, running, and it can use this endorsement as a kind of intermediate step to um, to get to what it wants. Dave Taylor is on the queue. Okay, uh, Dave Taylor, just to. Uh continue on the line of thought that uh, Lawrence started. There's things that I would like to add into a future version of the document, uh, but I'm happy to delay that until after adoption or whatever of, of an endorsement document, uh, because there is um, uh, the, the example that I showed for endorsement where, say, the manufacturer is endorsing the chip as, yes, it's, you know, Intel inside type of uh, endorsement um, with the following properties and what you can trust and so on is kind of what we usually think about. Um, but there's more complex ways that you can use them. So, for example, uh, if the software manufacturer of layer two, like that's an OS or whatever, wants to say, oh, yes, and here's some additional criteria that that software doesn't say, but I can vouch for the following things about that particular software, then you have this sort of tree of multiple endorsers. You have an endorser for layer zero that, when, that signs layer one. You also have a separate set. So you can think of it as a set of additional signed name value pairs or additional signed claims from somebody else that you can choose to trust. And if you do, then they kind of augment the layer zero, the layer one, or whatever with other things. Okay. So if you said, okay, I could get an endorser from Microsoft for the Windows operating system. I could get an endorsement from Red Hat for the RHEL operating system. I could get an endorsement from Intel for the chip and so on. And so all these you can kind of union in on the current state side. So you could do more complex things like that that actually would fall into the definition of endorsement. And this gets into the question of, is it just a key? No, it's a set of name value pairs that could be up here at a particular layer that's signed by some entity that better be in your trust anchor store or, you, or you'd not uh, trust the endorsement. So that's the type of discussion I think we could get into um, that would actually um, uh, build out the concept of what an endorsement was in a way that might allow even more uses than we've talked about in the working group. And so that was kind of what I'm thinking. And if you want to talk to me about that and give me your ideas of how I might flesh that out, then happy to work with others. So. Andrew Draper is on the queue. Hi. Um, yes, so it sounds like these endorsements are kind of conditional on, on other properties of the device. Um, and so I'd certainly be interested to talk to you about this. So is there a, this is a question for Dave Baylor, is there a repo where this draft is being developed and someone could open an issue, or start a conversation thread? Uh, Dave Baylor, yes, there is. I can post it the list, although if it gets adopted as a working group document, then my expectation would then transition over into the working group, um, in the working group organization, GitHub, and it would be there. Uh, but right now, yes, it's in github.com slash dthaler slash uh, rats endorsements or something like that. I'll, I can post the link to the list if you care, if you want. So that might be helpful. Um, yeah, Gary just got himself on the queue. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, um, this is going back to Thomas for the earlier uh, 
um, overview on the uh, conceptual message wrappers. There seems to be some sort of dependency that I was having trouble following between TCG, the CMW effort in, uh, in LAMPs. Um, is, um, could you maybe go over how that works and whether uh, the TCG is actually looking at, uh, at uh, EAT as part, eat in the concept of CMW, um, um, and then that would actually be used in an, in an extension to uh, to the lamps work on PKI. Thank Thomas, you. Are you there? This, this yeah, is a thanks. For Ned, mostly because I I don't have a firm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can answer it. Yeah, I can answer it. I think the answer, the short answer, is yes. Um, if there is a need to put a eat, um, what I think you would call it an unsigned eat token inside of a certificate, since the certificate is signed, you wouldn't necessarily need to sign it. Uh, the the, the uh, there would be a way to do that using a CMW certificate extension, and that and of course the CMW would identify the content, which would be could be an eat or or other things. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, just wanted to report, um, the data tracker has this cool feature that for any particular document, you can link the GitHub repository. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the data tracker page for the endorsements document and click on it and it's there. Anything else? Anybody want to comment or raise anything? Going once? Going twice? Nancy. All right. Can I I think we're... <laughs> sorry. Who, Just in time. Who's speaking up? <laughs> Thomas, sorry. Oh, Thomas. So I, I have a question for, for Chairs and Roman about uh, the progress of EAT. Um, so, what do you think would be? Um, you know, timeline-wise, the next um, steps for, for the document. Uh, so this is Ro Roman speaking, if Lawrence Geary or Carl want to, want to come to the mic. From my perspective, I did my AD review, which provided a bunch of feedback. And so at this point, it's for the, the author team to kind of you know, lead the working group to kind of resolve either the things I wrote or kind of tell me they really aren't issues and we shouldn't be concerned about them. Yeah, this is Gary here and I hope Lawrence will come to the mic as well. Um, from my perspective, we are, we are sorting through your document, uh, your review. I think what is a little bit confusing to me, though, was I was expecting other reviews, such as the IANA review. We did get an early one, but that was on an earlier draft. We and we haven't seen and we haven't seen any other broader reviews. Is is the security AD review uh, gating those? Yeah. So so let's kind of back up where we are in the kind of in the process. So after working group last call, the document goes. Uh, pu pu Publication is right after working group last call. There's a shepherd write up, and after that's completed, uh, publication is requested. Uh, so the next step is AD review. So that's where we are now. After we clear AD review, then it goes for IETF last call. And during IETF last call, uh, two additional things are triggered. First, uh, a number of directorates, uh, direct reviews are, are triggered kind of by stat, you know, just by statute process. So gen art, sec, uh, sector. It, 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 it kind of depends on, yeah, it depends on the area. And then the other thing that starts happening is that IANA takes a, an initial look at it. So IANA won't start looking at it until we begin IETF last call. So I just make a couple of comments. Uh, so first, thank you, Roman, for the thorough review. Um, that was good. Uh, I've looked over most of it and um, it's probably a couple of weeks till we get a, another draft. Um, there's some, uh, some thinking that needs to be done there. Um, and hopefully we can address most of that in conversation and in the next draft um, in a couple of weeks. And then I will not has hazard to pred predict what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I know this is a, a, a big document and it's had a long road, so anything I can do to help with uh, with the AD review. If there's something in particular we're concerned with relative to IANA review, it's not. We can certainly informally, you know, ask, but it will come as soon as we move to the next step. So we can talk about that offline. Yeah, I mean, the next step would be having the other area directors provide their feedback. So I would expect that they would, given the the length of the document. Right. Uh, so I, I, I stopped. Uh, I didn't complete the full thread of the process. So we're with AD review with me now. Then we're going to do IETF last call. That'll be directorates. That'll be that'll kick off the IANA review. After all IETF last call and director comments are adjudicated, then that goes for IESG review. And that's where the whole slate of ADs will do their usual document kind of process. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do the count again. <laughs> going once, going twice. All right, thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of the week and the rest of IETF 116. And thank you all those who uh, participated remotely, especially my co-chairs, Kathleen and Ned. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy and Roman. Yeah. Rich and Peter, if you can just let us know once you're done with the note taking, then okay. Yeah, Thanks. it's it's done. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rich. Thank you to the note takers. Yeah, Peter and Rich. Is there an optimist? So how's it going? Good. <laughs> Um, the uh, implementation of Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of work. 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 Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of